off at one o'clock. Uh, to this meeting of the Regional Transport Committee. Um, tēnā koutou, Linda, um, Sarah, waka kotahi, waka kotahi kru, as well as our councillors um, and our team uh, here in council, and also to our manuhiri uh, zooming in to us, uh, Chris and Martin. Well, I see Chris, but Martin may be joining shortly. Tēnā te vihi kia koutou katoa. Um, we're just going to go through our agenda. So we don't have apologies because the apology I received is actually in the room. Any declarations of interest? No declarations of interest? Then, I mean, as, as per our protocol, if you think that you're conflicted as we go through, just let us know. Uh, no leaders of absence, acknowledgements, acknowledgements and tributes. None. Public input and petition. So, um, I'd like to welcome um, Martin. Oh, is Martin joining yeah. us? Oh, okay. Tina Kui, Chris. I'd like to uh, welcome you and, and members of the of the rail. Um, what we what we call the official group. <laughs> rail action group. Tina Koto, Nikki Koto. Uh, um, just a warm welcome to you and we, we're all ears and eyes uh, to hear your um, presentation today. Will that be led by you, Chris? Yep. Okay. You're, we're in your hands. You want me to talk now, dear? Yes, please, if you'd like to. Yeah, okay. Well, um, <laughs> I was the uh, lead consultant on the report last year for um, the reinstatement of the rail, uh, and it covered the whole Napier to Gisborne area and came out at just over 80 million. Uh, the engineering issues on it were not considered to be uh, beyond the capability of local contractors as well as other contractors we have in New Zealand. Uh, the most costly part of that exercise was replacing Beach Loop, which um, is now not realistically um, reinstatable with a tunnel. And that was $25 million for the tunnel. I think the important point that I'd make on it is that we looked at this exercise not as something that was nostalgic because there were some people who talked to us about um, they can remember getting on trains and what have you. The purpose of the exercise was for an economic development reason for the Wairoa, Tarapati and the Hawke's Bay region as well. It gave you options. We were very clear to make it that rail does not replace road. Uh, they both work, they both need it, and in fact, in one scenario, there would be more truck movements, but there would be shorter distance, so that uh, some of the logging people said that they would be able to get two shifts out of a driver, because at the moment they only get one because they have to leave all the way from Gisborne and go down to Napier if they're not stopping off at Wairoa. Matafiro was an important part of that exercise. It would become an inland port, if you like. And what that meant was that even the port could use Matafiro with a shuttle service, which could, in the longer term, mean that trucks didn't have to come through the middle of Gisborne to go to the port, so that they could drop their logs at Matafiro and then a shunting service, which could even have been provided by the uh, Gisborne Vintage Rail because they've now got a um, certified shunting engine there. Um, so that it worked both ways. It worked to the Gisborne port, but it took logs down and joined with the Wairoa through to Napier. The engineering report that we received in March of this year indicated that there had been very little damage between Wairoa and Gisborne from the weather events 
and that's been confirmed as much as recently as a fortnight ago. And so the Wairarata Gisborne hasn't deteriorated any more than when the report was done last year. It has deteriorated between Wairoa and Napier, and most of that will be replaced through insurance. It also enables us to reduce the cost from the 80 million down, and we're not sure of the exact amount yet, because our 80 million included repairs to the West Shore Bridge, a couple of other bridges, and a couple of other pieces of infrastructure. So that 80 million, as I said, covered both uh, Wairo and Napier, as well as Wairo to Gisborne. The other thing, the other important point to make is that rail complements road, and some will say road complements rail, but ra rail actually complements road. And it enables full loaded containers to go by rail down to Napier rather than the restricted loads that are present. Uh, required because of some bridges and also the condition of some parts of that road. And so rail gives you an opportunity to export full containers from Gisborne through to Napier or elsewhere in the country. Um, but it is, as I said, and I keep repeating, this is not about replacing road. The other issue with roading, which we didn't take into account when we did the report, but if you had rail, you could replace and rebuild roads in areas that they needed, but you don't necessarily need to rebuild them up to the 50 tonne or 60 tonne capacity um, to have a road that is safer for everyone using it, be it a holiday maker or the trucks um, or local residents. We also had contact with Iwi and, and you'll know that Nikki has been um, working in that, at that area as well, and they have been fully supportive of it. And I see Iwi as critical um, to the future of this project, in fact, critical to whatever is, um, is done following the damage over the last few months. So I think that that's an area that um, we need to keep in mind. We also made it quite clear that while people are now talking about passenger rail, our reinstatement is driven by freight and by the economic benefits that it can deliver to the Tarafati and Wairoa areas. And it was interesting the amount now that's coming from Wairoa and to Gisborne to be processed. So that's um, it's another reason why that rail link works both ways. It's not just uh, taking stuff out of Gisborne down to Napier. It's all br also bringing stuff the other way. So it's it's northwards. So I think that, you know, I won't say anything more at this stage, except that I think um, we had a discussion just before Christmas with the council, and I think that I see it as critical, um, and just a bit of background, I was involved in the 2001 restructure of local government with um, uh, Sandra Lee. I was involved in setting up Land Transport New Zealand when we merged Transfund and Transit together. Uh, and for good or bad, um, I was the official that led the toll negotiations where we purchased rail back. And I think that having said that, the reason that I see this as important is not because rail um, is the be all and end all, but it benefits communities as well as um, the businesses. It's better for people who live beside roads it reduces the truck movements, the heavy truck movements. It enables you to do planning around the rail network in the same way as you can around a roading network, except the rail network isn't going 24 hours a day. And so you don't have quite the same restrictions and concerns about noise and so forth. So look, I think I'll leave it at that. I just think, you know, 
um, what you need to be thinking about is putting it as part of a comprehensive package, not just as a, a rail report. And when we did that rail report, we did make the point to ministers that this should be seen as part of a wider transport issue in Gisborne, whether it's State Highway 2 North West or State Highway 35 or State Highway 2 down um, to Waira and Napier. It should all be seen as part of a package, not just rail on its own. So look, I'll leave it at that unless someone's got some questions. Kinakwe, Chris, thank you very much um, for that. Um, I personally, I love, I love the idea of rail. I mm. hope one day to have a railway all the way to Farikaheka, the top of the coast where I live, because yeah. I have, you know, visions of sitting in a carriage, taking yeah. that that route um, to to town for council meetings. <laughs> but thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I just want to open it up to the committee to see if there's any questions. Um, Councillor Gregory. If, and just a reminder to use your microphones, please. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering what the inspiration is for you to be talking to us about this today. Um, is there something that's happened that I don't know about? Um, <laughs> well, look, I have to say that I was rather surprised I was talking to you as well. Um, I had emails and so forth, which um, had been a follow-up to government's announcement on rail and also on the rebuild from the cyclones and other weather events that have happened. And it was seen uh, from the person who asked me to do it as an opportunity to reinforce what I said before, that we need to make sure, particularly in light of what the government said in the budget about where can they extend the rail network and, and looking at passenger rail and so forth, to just reinforce the need for rail to be seen as part of a wider transport strategy. So look, um, I'm, I'm quite happy to talk to you, but I didn't make the invitation. So um, I was just asked to do it along with Martin. Thank you, Chris. Any further questions? Oh, oh no, thank you for that. Um, is Martin um, not here? No, well, I don't know. Martin's from Napier, so I'm not sure what, um, what the story is there. Hmm. Martin was going to talk to you I think in the context of decisions that they were making, as far as the regional council's concerned, they are doing quite a bit on the rail network, particularly seeing at the moment it only goes to Hastings, so they need to get that back up reinstated, and then they need to get the Napier to Wairoa reinstated. Um, being in Napier just a week or so back, um, the logging trucks that are sitting on the side of the road opposite Mighty 10 and so forth, um, have certainly increased in numbers since that Wairoa um, rail line has gone out. So I can see why they're concerned about it. Thank you. Heather, did you have something? Mm -hmm. um, Councillor Williams was sent a link yesterday, but he hasn't received it. So um, my suggestion would be that you could invite him back to the next RTC meeting. Hmm. Any further questions? <laughs> Councillor Telfer? You could, um, just um, regarding the assumptions for freight that were obviously done. At, That's uh, not coming through, sorry. Oh. Not. Sorry, Chris, we'll try it again. Yep. Um, just part of the, there's obviously assumptions being done on the volume of freight that could potentially go on a rail line track to justify this. That's obviously been done, hasn't it? Did you hear that, Chris? No, I can't. It, it's, no. Sorry, we'll just fix that problem. Kia ora, Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. 
So the question from Councillor Telford was regarding the volumes of freight and have the numbers been done as to what volume of freight would justify the lines being able to run? Uh, yes, there was a report done um, by Kiwi Rail themselves who indicated that um, they could make that line um, cover its costs um, at the existing charges that they were doing. And I think the, there is a copy of that uh, that the Gisborne District Council will have. It's from Alan Piper in Kiwi Rail. Uh, it was done at the same time as the Burl report, and we were advised that there was no change to that when we did the report last year. Um, secondly, uh, there is a feeling, and, and look, I, I still talk to um, uh, people regularly in the Beehive and others, there is a view that there will be some lines where it will be provided as a social and environmental form of transport rather than something that they're out to make a huge profit from. And so um, I think, you know, at the moment, the feeling is that there may, may be a desire to um, encourage mode shift, whether it's to a train or to a coastal vessel, even though that may not be um, a profitable um, venture in the, in the first stage. Um, so look, the answer to that is yes, Kiwi Rail did a report and Alan Piper from Kiwi Rail did one. He said it would cover the cost of the operation. Um, and we did get in the report last year uh, an indication of tonnage and Steve Weatherall, who had managed to increase the tonnage on the Gisborne line prior to its closure, um, still has promises of that same amount of freight going onto the trains. Any further questions from our committee? No. Thank you very much for your um, presentation today, Chris. Thank you for taking the time to zoom in and to Nikki and the others in the, uh, yep. in the back of the room who have come to support as well. Um, we will take that into consideration as we plan forward um, with our regional transport plan. And also there's the long-term plan for consideration as well. So thank you very much for, um, for the time, for your time today. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Okay, do we have any extraordinary business? Oops, Ooh, can't wait. Notices of motion, Ooh, adjourned business. I'm going to hand it over now to, <laughs> to Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. Um, so the first report, report 23, um, 104, is on a variation to the RLTP. Um, which has been sought by Walker Kotahi. So just in, in summary, it's about funding some additional program business case work around network resilience for the Tairawhiri and Wairau district area around highways two, city five. And um, I know the request says 28, but I'm presuming you mean 38. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. And so this would be 100% funded by Walker Kotahi through the state highway activity class. And it's basically the proposed investment is an extension of what was previously committed in the RLTP. And I guess in terms of the details of the work, I'm not over that. So if you have any questions about that, Sarah or Linda, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> have any? Yep, sure. Through you, Chair, so just procedure-wise, the reason why this sits here is because the Regional Land Transport Plan covers the state highways and the local roading network when we do our Regional Land Transport Plan. So it comes here because the Regional Transport Committee oversees the plans for both when we put those up to Waka Kotahi for funding. So when there's a major proposal or change to that Regional Land Transport Plan, it comes through this committee for us to be able to um, approve it, or you as the committee approve it, because you help recommend the plan that's set for the region that goes up for funding to Waka Kotahi when it comes back. So that's why it's coming back through, even though it's funded by Waka Kotahi and it's for the State Highway, 
the regional land, tra land transport plan covers both off. So that's why it's sitting in front of you today. We can't officially um, dig into the funding until it's been approved. We are digging into the funding, but we can't oh. officially until, <laughs> until it's been approved. Yes, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, it, I see it's 100% funded. Do, does that money come out of somewhere else? Is, is there a loss somewhere else or is that just a bonus? No, no. So it's part of the investment management activity class and there is sufficient funding still in that activity class and covers these kind of um, variations. So it's all good. It's not, no one else is losing money as a result. <laughs> Are you getting ready to say something, Councillor Telfer? No? Okay. Councillor Gregory? Sounds really good. 100% funding. <laughs> um, I'm happy to move the report. Just uh, Thank you, Councillor Gregory. So we'll have a mover in. And yeah, I just wanted to ask, so this is 2021 to 2031. How is all of the other, um, how, um, I guess in terms of all the other things that are going on in terms of the changes that are needing to be made to our long-term plan and all those other plans. How does, are we going to be changing this again, I guess is my question. And are we going to be asking for more money later? Which I assume that we are. Yes, please. Uh, just how it fits into our regional land transport plan is like your long-term plan, you review it every three years. Okay. We're getting to the end of it now. So it's about to be time for us to play this whole game again. When we reset the regional land transport plan, which feeds into your long-term plan, that's when we go back through, check budgets, check alignment, all of those kind of things. There's obviously been some significant changes to spending for the council and for Waka Kotahi when it comes to what's happened in the previous sort of 12 months with the events that we've had. So we're working through what that looks like. For this component that we've got here, this is because it's a substantial change on what we were trying to do and it wasn't identified in the RLTP. That's why it's sitting here for us, but we're about to redo this again when we re redo the RLTP uh, next year. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Thompson, so moved by Councillor Gregory, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Um, all in favour? Oh. Right. Carried, thank you. And the next one for our decision is back with you again, Charlotte. Charlotte, <laughs> There's a little bit of a Charlotte show at TC at the moment. Um, so um, this paper leads on from some of the workshops that we've done to date this year. Um, hopefully they are still um, fresh in your mind or fresh-ish. <laughs> um, so um, uh, just carrying on, I guess, from what Dave just mentioned, we're obviously um, starting up that review slash refresh process of our RLTP. Um, for 2024, um, so that's due for completion in April next year. Um, and we started off that process with looking at our investment logic map to see if we felt that was still relevant or not given, um, I guess, what has happened since we last mm. worked on our, our LTP. Um, so the the attachments presented in the paper reflect the discussions that you had at the workshop and the draft problems, benefit statement, and some suggested um, options for KPIs. There's quite a lot of KPIs listed for each one, and um, we probably, in the end, we wouldn't have all of them in our, our, our LCP, but we will, um, we're looking at, as staff at, at those KPIs to see which ones we do have good data on and could therefore um, measure etc um so i guess that was kind of all i really had to say on it unless you wanted me to go into it in more detail do we have any questions was a lot was a, was a lot to read um, um i mean in terms of trying to it's great to have the hard copy now to try and see that but do we have any questions from any of our committee there is a key table in this summary if you want the the short easier to <laughs> oh, um, I wanted to thank the team for organising the workshops that we had um, and they were very useful although some of the tools 
we struggled to find our way around. Um, but the um, it's amazing how all of that gets shrunk down to to something manageable. So um, thank you to the team who have worked on this. Do we, um, does our committee agree with those problem, cause and effect statements that are in there? These are the ones that we identified as part of the workshop. Is there anything uh, more that we'd like to see included in that? Can you explain, but Charlotte, what the waiting means? Is it attached to money? Yes. <laughs> Excuse my ignorance. <laughs> yes, it does oh, flow things. through into, I guess, your priorities and how you spend your money. Um, so that was the bit that we talked about towards the end of um, one of the workshops in terms of which which problem area was sort of your top priority, and therefore we um, um came up with some rough ratings, uh, waitings based on, um, I guess, the discussions that you had, you could amend them a little bit. Um, if you make some too small, they have very little impact. So I guess tens probably is as low as you should go. Um, but if you did want to tinker around the weightings a little bit, if you didn't feel that they accurately reflected um, what is your priority, um, then we can talk about that. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, yeah, just at the moment where we've got so many roads with issues, etc. I, I just don't feel that reducing our carbon emissions, to, just given that we're 0.17% of carbon emissions, I, I, don't, I just don't see that as a priority where you've got people who haven't even got access to, to me, get, get everyone access and then look at that as a bonus down the track. I don't see that as a priority. Open roads and stuff. Sorry, which page are you on? Please? Sorry, page 12. Oh, you are on page 12. Yeah, I, I don't see that as gives one of Gisland's priorities, given that we, we are not, nothing really. Um, just to keep in mind that this RLTP is a 14 year period as well. It's not just for the initial period where there will obviously be a lot of recovery work. And so the programs that we have in here to reflect these problem statements fit over a 10 year period. And we then prioritize each year based on what we can feasibly do in terms of construction, as well as what we can feasibly get in terms of funding. The other thing is, is that, and, and I, I can always let um, Sarah or Linda speak to this, but there are different set, different buckets that come through from Waka Kotahi for funding. So, um, it's not just like there's one pool, there's tagged areas. Um, I don't know if Sarah wants to explain that more, Linda, explain that more Thank detail. You, Linda. Do I call you Linda at this table? Or do I miss Stuart, Liz, Stuart, Liz, Stuart? <laughs> Linda spoke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Thompson, you raise a, a really valid question that I think is important for members to debate and discuss. Um, officer's advice is quite correct that it's um, it's always a challenge for us as a committee to think strategically long term, especially when we're faced with significant challenges in an immediate horizon, which is what you're you're referencing. I think I would encourage us as a regional transport committee to make sure that we um, set the region up to make the most advantage of the signals central government sending around funding first and foremost, and how that aligns with the needs of the region. So the advice from officers in Wakakotahi is, how do we look at your aspirations for the region and what you want to achieve as a whole, given you've got very rural communities, as well as quite a large, dense urban centre as well. Um, I think it would be it would probably be ill advised to say that um, climate change is perhaps or reducing emissions is perhaps not something to think about in the long term, given what we are experiencing. But it's got to be done in the context of your region, which I think is the point that you're making. Um, 
when we're looking at how to secure funding, you probably want to think of it from a resilience perspective and how you want your uh, land transport network to function. So looking at your state highway corridors, your local roads, and what's strategically really important around access, around maintenance, uh, um, corridor performance. But at the same time, noting as well that we've got in here things around safety and also as well that we've got it around multimodal. So how you want your city centre to function too. So it is really important when the officers are providing us with advice that we look at it in its whole and kind of weigh up, does that weighting feel about right as opposed to just thinking kind of one part or the other? And, and, and I think that's what I'm getting from the advice that's here is, We've got a few buckets or problems to consider. How, how do we feel that they're balanced? And perhaps you're feeling like the balance isn't quite right. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to sort of say to someone that emissions is more important than getting their road open at the moment or making their road resilient. But you know, I get what you're saying. We're just mm -hmm. aligning with the funding buckets available to us and we're silly not to tap into that funding and the needs of the different community if i i might share so how you want your children in gisborne cvd to get to school might be to improve access to walking and cycling so their parents don't have to drop them off but if you're in ruatoria having access to a functioning state highway or local road network for 360 days of the year is more important to them so it's how do we how do we as a committee balance those differing and what can sometimes feel competing needs are? The other bit that's missing from this at the moment is the um, government policy statement on land transport, which we won't get till June. So our RLTP does also need to align to the priorities and outcomes in that as well. And the, um, But also in terms of, I guess, your point, you have weighted having a resilient network as 30% in terms of a priority versus the problem where it mentions emissions is only weighted as 15. So you are saying in your RLTP that it is more important to have resilient network roads than it is to do the projects like that, that would fit under that problem statement around emissions reduction and walking in slightly neighbor south streets already. Yep, yeah, I, I get it. It's more aligning with the funding buckets and we're silly not to tap into them. Yep, Sarah? Um, just to remind committee members that this, this RLTP is just a review. And so if you mess around with your priorities too much and your weightings too much now, what you could end up doing is losing funding potentially on projects that are already within your RLTP. And so it's again, keeping that balance so that those, those projects which have already been prioritized and um, um, consulted with, with the community are not forget it, forget it. So if you want to reprioritize your weightings, you would have to look at it in the context of projects that are already within the um, regional land transport plan. Appreciate that advice, Sarah. Thank you. We're all pretty much newbies around here, so trying to sort of understand what that, um, all of that as well. I think um, in the regional um, land transport plan, and, and this committee is focused on strategy and the bigger picture stuff, and I think some of the questions that we have might be better in ops here. So, right, like the, the state of grading and stuff. So, through you, Chair, the works that need to happen in the now are your operations committee discussions that's yep. where are we doing the right projects in the right time 100 percent. that's an operations committee discussion where we sit now and we can't it's kind of as sarah said it's quite a a strange place because we're trying to review what we've got in our rltp without triggering the need to redo or consultation whilst we wait for Ministry of Transport to actually tell Waka Kotahi what its priorities are going to be as to how it's going to fund as well. So there's remember there's a hierarchy where Ministry of Transport actually sets the priorities for us. Waka Kotahi then funds according to those priorities. Once they get those from Ministry of Transport, they then give effect to that through the funding and through our regional land transport plan. So until we get that, we don't know what those priorities are. We do get to provide comment on the... Um, priorities from Ministry of Transport and we would 
which we look for you to do that as a committee to provide feedback to MOT. However, once that's set, then we have to give effect to it because the funding is locked to those priorities once we get to there. So there's a number of stages to go before we get to reset the RLTP and those priorities that sit in amongst it. You can put things up that are not those priorities, absolutely, but Waka Kotahi will have a very hard case being able to fund those if we put them up. We've done it in the past, and that's where it's 100% ratepayer funded, and that's how we do it. But it's to everybody's benefit if we align with those priorities as we develop that funding schedule coming up. But we'll walk you through that process in quite a bit of detail around how you have the ability to influence both our work programs that we'll put up, because remember this committee will recommend to council a big chunk of that spend in the long-term plan, but this is how we give effect to it through this process as we go through it. Any further questions? Just sorry, through your chair, it does sound super complicated, but the more that we get into it <laughs> genuinely, it will it will come together. I can feel your pain. I've been there. <laughs> I appreciate you guys not speaking in too much alphabet today. It's great. Um, but um, yeah, so this is my second. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. It's it is. We've got all sorts of plans, plans changing, plans needing reviews. Um, so just trying to put all the pieces of the jigsaw together, I think. Um, so if we don't have any further discussion to, from our committee, um, do we have someone, we have to approve this, right, it's a decision. Approve the draft investment logic map and benefits map and delegates authorization of any changes to Chief of Strategy and Science in consultation with the Regional Transport Committee Chair. What? Do we have any, a mover? Thank you, Councillor Gregory, and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Telfer. All in favour? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Now, we'll move on to number 10. 10.1. Who, who's running this show? Is this your show? Oh, your show too, Charlotte. Okay. It's my show. Okay. I just... <laughs> Um, so this monitoring report, um, we normally do a quarterly monitoring report, however your first official meeting in February was cancelled due to the cyclone, so you, you would have had a half year report then, but we have just tacked on quarter three this time, so it's just about an annual report, but not quite. Um, so this covers the activities from July last year through to March this year, sorry it says March 2022 in the report. Friday itis when I was writing it. Um, um, yeah, so I'm not going to go through it all in detail. There's a lot of there's a lot of detail in there. Um, um, and it's the I guess the purpose of the quarterly report is about um, giving you a feel for how we're going in terms of that particular year of the RLTP against our work program and what we said we were going to do, how much we were going to spend, and I guess how far through we were going to get certain through certain activities. Um, you will see it is currently read. Um, yep. I guess due to um, the impacts of multiple weather events, um, we uh, if you had if February hadn't happened, the uh, half year report it would have been orange, and the commentary there was we really needed some very good weather in February March to catch up. Um, so I guess that gives you a bit of an indication of we were already slightly behind pre. We needed some good weather to catch up. We did not get it, and we sustained further damage. So. Um, I don't think I can really elaborate much more on that. Can we just say that we were behind because of the weather that we've already had in our construction season for September, October. Yeah. So as we all know, it's been raining for a very long time. It wasn't just that. It no, no. Particularly the resales budgets we were having issues with because we couldn't get ground conditions. Yeah. So that was the commentary that you would have seen in February in the report, but I've updated it since. So we're behind. We're still behind. We're, we're still behind, behind, just yeah. more behind. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Yes, Councillor Gregory. Thank you. Just on page uh, 30, um, you know, that uh, talks about the uh, Tatahiro Walk Cycleway. Just wondering uh, when said staff are reviewing the first draft, and there are four options. Um, who decides that? When is that? When is, you know, so you review it, then what happens? And um, that's all. 
so through you, Chair, and apologies for the journeys teams not really being here today. So Dave Headfield is on leave. Libby is also wrapped up in response um, today. So apologies for the team not being here. But Tina is here to help me with some of this as well. Um, so for Tarihiru, the intention for that is for that to come back to council. So that will be, we will give some recommendations around the outcome of that business case. The business case process will show us which the costs, what we can afford to do and those things, then we'll bring something back to you with commentary around what funding potential looks like for that as well. And what um, funding we think that could attract, but would have to be subject to an application and then funding being available and us getting through a funding process before we were able to do anything further. But this, the business case is the basic entry to find out if you're able to get funding. And that's what we have to do as part of that. Is option two a full river path? Have the weather events um, kind of scuttled that idea? Through the chair, um, we had concerns around a full river path from an engineering point of view, from a climate change resilience point of view, but also from a floodwater conveyance as part of this going in. So this was previously identified as a risk for the project. Um, the weather events may have confirmed some of our thinking around that. Thank you. We've got, yes, Councillor Thompson. Page 37, just, just wondering if you can give us some more detail around healthy waterways plan. Thanks about that. Through the chair, my understanding of that is that's around where we're looking at our stormwater upgrades that we need to do across, and that's part of the freshwater plan work that we have on. So as the Road Control and Authority, we actually have quite a large impact on the stormwater health and network for Tairawhiti. So a lot of that's around where we've got um, provisions under the new national policy statement for freshwater, where we have to be upgrading some of our in-road structures, we call them. So the stormwater sumps and those things, that's around the plan that needs to be done as part of that, but that includes the stormwater team, and we haven't been able to progress that given the events we've been responding to. Yeah, but just in terms of three waters, the more fits with that. Is there any detail? Uh, through the chair, the stormwater advisory group has yet to come back with the rulings for, or their recommendation, sorry as to where stormwater starts and finishes between road control and authorities and the proposed water entities. So we're still waiting to hear what their final recommendation will be. Councillor Telfer. Yeah, um, through the chair. Um, yeah, I'm just on page 29, um, point 15 there, um, related to attachment one. It says there that emergency works do impact on the ability to deliver business as usual work. And then point 17 carries on um, regarding to progress, whether events continue to influence the business as usual roading program, including responding. I'm just wondering, is there a thing coming through there that we've got this business as, as usual work approved and, and now planned to be done? We have these weather events coming along. This is almost saying to me that, that our model is being totally um, skittled almost mm. by by emergency work, and I'm wondering whether our model is actually now fit for purpose, whereas um, if our contractors um, have to spread themselves too thin, is, is, it, is it more a matter of having a, looking at the contract as being business as usual, this is what you guys are trying to achieve in the year. When we have these emergency works come along, we have another group of pre-approved contractors, because a lot of that work, uh, money that's coming in to do this emergency work is separate funding we have been coming on just like this has probably happened all the time i presume it does it's probably happened for a long time i'm just wondering whether our, mm. our our contracts are not actually that fit for purpose because my way of thinking is if there's business as usual out there to be done and resealing and we're going to look at the state of our roads and, and every phone call and text you get as a councillor is basically regarding 90 percent of this to our roading network mm. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether we need to have a really good look at that and, and we could have um, two separate, so that we don't, this is, it doesn't just go on the back burner every time, we just keep getting further behind. So through you Chair, one of the things that's set up in the new contracts that came effective this year is around our 
road and maintenance contractors have to show us what their response teams look like separate from their business as usual teams. When we have an event the size of Gabrielle, the contractors are able to take their staff off programs maintenance works and move them over to opening the roads. One of the things that we talk about emergency works right now. So when there's an emergency, state of emergency, opening roads, cutting up access, that is the most important thing. So everybody comes off maintenance to do those. They've already gone back to BAU across the network. So there's BAU. So the sealing season is almost complete. Ford and Hogan have managed to catch it back up and they're going to finish their sealing season, um, thankfully, with days like today. So we will have that completed. One of the things we're doing, so the network at the moment is about 85% of it is back to business as usual. The contractors have been asked to show who is back on BAU. And given the volume of works that we have coming up for recovery, they have to show us how that is a different team than what is proposed for their maintenance team that is going forward. So a lot of the work that we're doing with them, it's very separate and they have to show that they're separate. In their contracts, they have to show their emergency response teams, which includes their named subcontractors who will come onto the network to be able to do things. So they have to show that as part of it. The works that we've prioritised them for that came off maintenance was around getting the roads open, as I said, but getting the drainage repaired as quickly as possible. So they, we worked with the teams to do maintenance work. It was actually the recovery work, so clearing slips, clearing culverts, doing those things getting it as fast up to scratch so it gets to a maintainable network. Then we look at who's actually allowed to do the retaining walls, the slips, the dropouts and those things as well. The other component of it is that when we have an emergency response or a large event like Cyclone Gabrielle, the productivity disappears really quickly for our maintenance contractors. The grader can't go one road to another, to another, to another. They lose the loops, the productivity that we've agreed with them, which gets us the rates that we have. By halting the maintenance works, we're able to keep doing things faster so we can get it back up to that productivity when it comes to the maintenance going forward. So the maintenance graders are back now because they can do back up to their productive routes. But when it's not productive, there's no point chucking a grader out there that's just got to lift the blade and drive around. It, it's, we're throwing good money after bad transporting it all the time. But as soon as we can get it back off cleaning roads up, that's when it's back doing maintenance after that. But they very much have to show back to BAU, those teams are back on BAU, they're not jumping between the two. Um, I just, uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I just acknowledge that you're, you're there, uh, Martin. Um, thank you for taking the time. We're just gonna finish this item on our agenda and then I'll invite you to come and, and talk to us about um, oh, adding adding to Chris's it all earlier with us. I appreciate the time that you've taken to, to come and speak to us. So we'll give, we'll give you a little time and just wrap up this this particular piece in our agenda. Do we have any more questions? Yes, Teddy? Oh, sorry, Councillor Thompson. <laughs> um, page 36, um, you've shown there's over 200 um, sites with, with issues um, with which you need traffic management, some, some being three years away. So I'm just wondering if the funding covers traffic management for three years or mm. that's something the council's aware of. So through the chair with the traffic management for those sites is funded by Waka Kotahi. What we've done with the traffic management is we've changed the approach to no longer having cones and transportable signs for those. We've put the four before posts in with those where there are more permanent structures being put in place so that we can, and we've had it approved um, around not having to have the checks that we would normally have because we've basically one way that section of road properly and put enough safety things in that we don't have to go back to make sure nobody's messed with signs or cones or those kind of things. So we've come up with a cheaper way of doing it, um, but it is funded as part of the work. Anyone else? I have a couple of questions. Um, on page 27.5, uh, it says which uh, framework is structured on the National Transport Outcomes Framework, how the transport system supports can improve intergenerational well-being and livable out livability outcomes. What does intergenerational well-being mean in regards to this? Please. <laughs> The idea is we're meant to obviously look past our own generation in terms of that intergenerational. So looking at mokopuna and 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So have, the idea is to look long term as under the trends for outcomes. Thank you. And um, on page 28, where it talks about the resident resident satisfactory survey, how are they those people, participants selected? Um, so there is a process and the key research do that. Um, so they have particular quotas and targets based on demographics. And then um, they call, I think they predominantly call people, but they do have access to mobile numbers now. So um, it's randomized, I guess. And then, and, but in terms of how many people from demographics, that's based on trying to get a representative sample of our community. Hmm. Interesting. I know, you know, lots of people don't have um, phones or cell phones or um, uh, easily reachable, except on maybe Facebook and social media. So yep. I'm just interested in how um, how demo, how the, the the data that's coming back, whether that is a true reflection of our community. Um, yeah, and and we do intend to look at that resident satisfaction survey and how we the methodology that sits behind it because yes we do realize that you know phone is a little bit particularly it did used to be just landline not just mobile until quite recently so um unless we've updated to that i guess um but that doesn't sit in um in my area so i don't want to speak out of turn in terms of time frames etc but i just wanted to let you know that it is on the work program to look at in terms of methodology yeah i think that's really important if we want to be um you know porno about the data that we're collecting that is reflective of our community um you know, my other question was about the site plan in Tarukira as well i'm just wondering about this because i hear about the national spatial planning act and tranches and things like that. Where, does that fit into all of this discussion anywhere? In short, it will at some point, I guess right. is the short answer. Obviously, um, if we're looking at a spatial approach to planning for our region, transport is an important part of that. How that interacts with the RLTP and what may need to change in that regard is still to be worked through in terms of the detail is my understanding. And that has been some of our feedback back to that draft bill. Because yeah. um, obviously we do not want to be duplicating processes. Please. <laughs> um, are there any further comments on, on this particular? Oh, sorry, Teddy, Thompson, Councillor Thompson. <laughs> sorry, Ugh, my teeth. Uh, just page uh, 44 and 45 with our township upgrades out there on the state highways should we be funding street lights etc et or should this be coming under state highways so through you chair this work was funded a lot of it by waka kotahi under our subsidized rates that we have so the funding buckets will have administered it but the funding for it has come through from different classes for it to be able to be done it's just been delivered by the journeys team so we do have lighting issues on the state highway that are our assets as well. So there are a number that are our assets. The footpath is ours that sits along the side though. We've delivered it, but it's been funded by Waka Kotahi through our funding assistance rates. And while we're on that, those pages, and I see the work that's, I drive past the work that's being done at Tiki Tiki and Rangituki and hear from the community. Um, uh, great feedback on that for the work that's been done. So thank you. Um, any other questions? Do I need to? That's just the information, isn't it? Oh, so I just move that for noting. Thank you, Rob. Uh, all in favour? Thank you. Right. Hand it over to. Oh, sorry, sorry. We go go back to Martin. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, Tinakwe Martin. Uh,
in in Nohawana. Uh, Cool Martin Williams took away Noah on the chair of the Hawke's Bay Regional um, Transport Committee. And uh, thank you for uh, accommodating me slightly outside the, the, the slot today. It would seem there was a glitch with email addresses or links. So Chris McKenzie has forwarded me the link and here I am. And as I say, thank you for um, taking the time to, to uh, share with me about this important kaupapa. So, so uh, yeah, over to you, over to you, Martin. Yeah. Thank you. Well, look, I, I didn't get to hear what Chris had to say, um, but I have been um, from a Hawke's Bay, from the, the Hawke's Bay end of things, if you like, uh, reasonably closely involved in the project uh, of uh, seeking government funding for a detailed business case to reinstate the Gisborne to Wairua railway line over the past two to three years. And I thought in that context, it was uh, particularly important now to reach over the hill, as it were. Um, there is an increasing, I think, government focus uh, looking at the East Coast as a combined unit for transport planning purposes and for infrastructure planning purposes generally, uh, perhaps um, drawing on the, the three waters alignment that's just happened and noticing that uh, Wakakotahi, and I think I can see Linda there, um, we've been uh, treated to some of the thinking around the Tairawhiti to Wairoa and then the Hawke's Bay um, Resilience Recovery Projects and it is that integration uh, across the two regions uh, that is important, uh, but I think equally um, across transport modes, and I'll come back to that. Uh, transport aside, Hawke's Bay and uh, Gisborne uh, or Tairawhiti uh, share the same pain and the same degree of devastating impacts on uh, our communities and our transport inf infrastructure uh, in particular. Um, we've we've uh, certainly witnessed that from a distance with our friends in Wairoa and, and uh, observed uh, with considerable sympathy and interest what's happened up in, in Gisborne over the last two years and in the East Coast more, more generally. Uh, we've been completing uh, the initial stages of our regional land transport plan, uh, that's the investment logic mapping uh, phase in particular, and we've had a very... Uh, I guess, close and uh, focused um, approach to the issues surrounding resilience. Um, and resilience is now identified as the dominant problem and the principal benefit of all future uh, investment decisions in our transport network. Um, as, we, as we look at, uh, I guess, evaluating different transport investments and pitching to the National Land Transport Fund and uh, you know, for, for next year's round, of funding, and key to that is, is a multimodal approach. Um, as it stands, both Tairawhiti and Hawke's Bay are immensely vulnerable um, to, to climate change related impacts. Uh, and we, we were both severed in every single direction um, back in February. Um, you, you couldn't get in and out of Napier in, in any way, shape or form, short of a short of a walker there for a few days. So, um, I, in that context, fully endorse uh, a letter that was signed um, by uh, the uh, Nadine Thatcher and by the Mayor, um, Riot Stoltz of Gisborne District Council and our CEO and, and Chair uh, to uh, the Minister of Transport, really just urging upon them the need to think about transport solutions for these regions holistically and across modes and to make you know, ambitious levels of investment in, in our transport corridors, um, both road and rail, to ensure that we are in a more resilient position for future events of that kind. Um, so that, that's the context for me, uh, I guess, reaching out across the hill, as I said uh, today. And I'm sure Chris has spoken to you about the Gisborne Rail project in that, in that context. But you know, from, from our perspective, as we see it in Hawke's Bay, um, and certainly this is my view, it's got very significant environmental, economic and social benefits. Um, it's, uh, it stacks up against investments in, in roading infrastructure across all of those um, domains. 
it's feasible in engineering terms. It actually, particularly the Gisborne to Wairua section stood up very well and better than a lot, better than a lot of our roads um, in, in Cyclone Gabriel. Um, the major washouts in 2012 uh, weren't exacerbated. Um, so the, the information that went to the government last year in pitching for a business case remains valid. Uh, that's the engineering advice received. And I guess uh, just to round out uh, and conclude with a couple of points, um, I guess uh, you, you'd appreciate uh, around your tepu, and I think this is true, that as two regions combined, we punch um, better and stronger uh, and with more impact in terms of securing attention from government, uh, from the ministers and from, from a funding perspective. And if we show that alignment uh, and we speak with one voice around transport investment, I think um, that will be to our mutual benefit. And we recently had uh, quite an excellent presentation from Kiwi Rail uh, about the work they are doing to reinstate uh, the severed railway lines to the south and north of Napier Port. Um, and uh, basically it's a, it's a reinstate proposition at this stage, uh, applying insurance uh, funding. Um, so that should get things back to where they were. But going forward, we, we, we uh, met with Kiwi Rail last year and they urged us to be in, in uh, tandem with them and lined up with them uh, through our regional land transport plan process uh, to ensure that there was a, uh, a cross-pollination, a talking to each other uh, and our, our bids to essentially what is the same National Land Transport Fund for both road and rail, so that their um, rail uh, national investment plan um, was informed by our regional land transport plan and vice versa. And you get that greater integration of modes across modes, which is inherent to resilience, uh, my point earlier made. So that's me. That's really what I wanted to share with you. Um, just to um, say, you know, we, we very much welcome work, working together across regions. Um, perhaps more than has been done in the past. Cyclone Gabriel may have been a catalyst for that, um, but it's the shared resilient future that I'm sure um, we're all interested in now. So thank you. Happy to take any questions or just leave you with those thoughts. Thank you, Martin. And it's good to put a face to the name as the chair of this regional transport committee and put a daughter down <clears throat> at school in Hawke's Bay. Um, uh, and I'd be interested in connecting with you at some point to discuss our, the mutual uh, issues around this kaupapa. Do we have any questions from anybody? Councillor Gregory. Um, thank you very much for um, making the time to come back because it makes a lot more sense um, hearing from you. Um, as well as uh, Chris earlier. So um, are you saying that you've, in your plans, um, you have already added in there that you want to uh, work to reinstate the rail between Napier and Gisborne? Or yes. You're, you're going to? Well, it's both actually. Uh, my recollection of the 2021-2024 plan is that we would uh, advocate given that we couldn't have direct access to funding under the legislation as it was, we'd advocate um, for the reinstatement of that railway line. Uh, that's the Gisborne to Wairua part of it. Uh, the council was very successful in um, supporting uh, with central government, the Wairua to Napier section of it uh, under the previous chair, Alan Dick. <clears throat> but yes, yeah, so we do have a, a policy position of advocate, and that's what we've been doing in supporting the business case that the winter government last year. Um, and so now we're really in the early stages of what the 2024 to 27 uh, RLTP will look like. Um, and I think, as I've just shared with you, that's going to come from a multimodal and resilience focus. So where that lands in terms of our priorities in, in funding bids, I'm not sure, um, but the Gisborne connection would certainly fit with those principles. Kia ora, thank you. 
Thank you, Martin. I think um, we've had a couple of workshops on our um, RLTP and we've got a workshop following this. Um, so your um, your call it all with us is timely in terms of our thinking um, around the region and, and makes sense. Um, what engagement have Iwi had in your discussions around the this kaupapa? Well, I, I think that's more been from um, the northern end than from um, the southern end of our rohi, if you like. Okay. Um, and we, we have a representative of the Māori Committee on our committee, uh, and the messages that we've got from both directions, to that extent at least, has been supportive. Um, but I think uh, Nikki would be, uh, Sarang would be better placed to um, speak to uh, that from the northern end of our rohi uh, okay. directly to you. Thank you. As, as Nikki's in the audience, <laughs> would you like to respond to that, Nikki? How am I? Come to the, well, I'll ask you to come to the microphone. Tēnā koe. Kia ora tātou, committee and Madam Chair. Uh, yes, so Nai Taimanuhiri um, have certainly responded. Um, I haven't um, uh, talked this year with them. I think we've all sort of been preoccupied with uh, Cyclone Gabriel, but um, yeah, we've continued to have discussions up to uh, Christmas and they were certainly supportive of the rail being reinstated. Um, I, I think that there's always been this, um, like I put it this way, um, passion for the rail, um, particularly with Ngai Tamaruhi. For those of you who would not know, but um, when the 28 Battalion was returning from um, war and landed in Wellington, uh, they came through on the train, on the rail, and stopped at Naitamanahiri before they came through to Tepoharawiri. So those historical linkages um, keep the next generation connected as well. And I think through Jody Toroa and also uh, the CEO, there's been a lot of discussions to support it. Do we have any any other questions for no? Thank you. Nā mihi kiakui, Nikki. Nā mihi. Um, I just want to acknowledge again the rail group for coming today um, to put your kaupapa before us, and it gives us uh, and thank you again, Martin, for your time. I do hope to catch up with you sometime in the Hawks Bay, or if you're coming this way. Um, te mihi katoa um, mia kaupapa. Hey, fakaro, hey, kai mo te heningaro, mo tātou. Tēnā koutou. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou, mā te wā. Aira. Okay, we'll go back to our... Um, did we get there? No, we're on to our waka kotahi. Up to you, over to you, Linda. Thank you. We're going to wait for time too. You, Linda. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, first of all, before we get into a presentation proper, I just want to take on a moment to acknowledge the impact of the cyclone, um, acknowledge what you and your communities and council have gone through and continue to, to go through. Thank you. Um, also as well to thank you all for your support and partnership throughout. We've all played very active roles in the response. For us, that's all about the land transport system. And I know for you, it's about much, much more than that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, as we, we work through all of this together, that you and your community are seeking clarity from Waka Kotahi and from central government. Um, we will strive to provide every bit of information that we can, but I would want to acknowledge that it's a dynamic and developing situation, particularly when it comes to things like funding, um, and that we will operate as transparently as possible, 
uh, and as well it's a, a trust environment too and I think that's how we've operated together so far through the uh, initial response and how I hope we continue to work together through the, the longer term recovery. Um, just as this is our first our first RTC meeting together uh, was supposed to be in February, um, just a bit of a run through um, on the, the kind of format for this. You've got you've got both detailed packs from the February as well as this one in here. The purpose of those packs is um, they're very operational. They're very project driven, but they are a lot of the questions that we have found members have or get asked from their community. Uh, I don't speak to those. I'm happy to answer any questions, but it's a way in which to still provide you with information that's relevant and valuable without it taking up a, <clears throat> a huge amount of the, the committee's time. Mm -hmm. I go through a, a different presentation that's a higher level, it's more strategic and it's aligned to your regional and transport plan. And as well, usually at the beginning, we provide a few national slides as well, just to give you context as to what else is happening in the land transport system more broadly across the motor, but as well how that relates to Te Tarafati. And how do we go? It doesn't look like it's on. Is it on? Here we go. Sorry. Oh, it's buzzing. <laughs> this way? Which way? For the committee, we have got an issue, Colin. You're not so councillor order. We were not the ones in the fault the other day. There is an issue in here with the Wi Fi, so it's not personal. All right, just so you know. So, we've got a few issues just with the wiring. Sorry, you've got the magic touch the wiring. Oh, okay, okay, I'll give you a, a hands up. So we'll run through now just a few on the national context and then we'll bring it right back to Titarafati. Um, so Arataki, uh, Arataki is now live and Arataki is our 30 year plan or view for the land transport system right across Aotearoa. Uh, we know that the next 30 years will see significant changes uh, to how we want our places to function and how we move around our places. Um, and that transport plays a really critical role in how you would all want to shape your place and your region. So we need to have a, a shared view right across the sector, right across AWE, our partners, and how the system needs to evolve. And also as well, how we work together to support each other through that process. And um, the land transport system is one part of that. Uh, you're across all of those other intricacies that we've spoken about today in terms of things like urban development, land use planning, your RLTP processes, water RME reform and it, it's got to sit within that wider context. What this does give us is a national view uh, and it gives us as well a national direct direction as informed by um, ministers and Ministry of Transport looking longer term at the different drivers, pardon the pun, um, but as well uh, different policy settings uh, what's happening internationally and what the future of transport would look like in Aotearoa. We then bring it down and you'll note if you get the time to jump online, it is all available online, that there's then regional directions. So there is a focused area uh, for Tairafati within that. And that gives us a, a look to the future um, for this region. Uh, as well as taking into account some of the challenges, but as well the opportunities. So this looks at kind of that long-term view, and then we bring that all the way back to kind of our RLTP development, which is the, the shorter that three and then 10 year view. So it's a really important part, especially for, for us in a governance role, but even more so for um, uh, our subject matter experts and our officers using that to help shape the kind of advice that they're giving you and your council for what we need to consider in terms of planning and investment. Next one. Total change of tact. Um, bitumen. <laughs> this, is a, this is a really exciting one. <laughs> um, together, so Waka Gutahi and our local government partners, we use about 90% of all of the bitumen uh, within um, New Zealand. 
Um, because of certain changes uh, around the Marsden Point facility, but also Zed Energy exiting out, exiting out of this market, Waka Kotahi undertook a full review of how the market was functioning and if we were to move to a complete import model. Um, we got a lot of feedback from our partners, but as well, importantly, the industry um, on some of the risks involved in there, but as well, some of the opportunities and particularly around things like pricing and quality. Um, that review has come out um, very positively uh, in terms of the, the import market. Uh, as well as market conditions and access to high quality bitumen. I know this sounds like a very unusual thing to discuss in this context, but it is, it's a critical part of overall how we function everything from pavements to roading, and it's a critical part of our supply chain overall. So we're confident um, that the open market model, so the import model will function very well and, and is functioning uh, well at the moment. We've got to work through some price indexing uh, with Z Energy moving out of the, the market uh, mid this year. So this has been in training and work for maybe about 18 months now. Next one. Um, Increase in number of water damaged vehicles. Um, this is a huge, huge thing. And it's a huge part of our work as a regulator uh, rather than a, a road controlling authority. Um, we've seen um, a significant increase, of course, of the number of water damaged vehicles that are um, getting flagged or uh, uh, registered. Um, but it's got quite a um, huge flow on effect for the market. Uh, and that is the supply and demand. So it's not just uh, individual car owners that have had their uh, vehicles damaged. There's huge car lots that have been completely taken out on new vehicles and secondhand vehicles. So there will be a flow on effect into the vehicle market. Um, it, it, we've prepared quite an extensive piece on our website that just helps both the commercial sellers as well as you know, people like us uh, how to navigate some of this, because what do you do when that's happened? What's the process for it? Uh, what do you do with your insurer? What do you do if you're not insured? Um, but as well, there are some risks here of people um, thinking, you know, once it's dried out, it'll be good to go, um, which, you know, we can't just assume, but also as well damaged vehicles then entering the second hand market and the risks that surround that. So there, there is a lot of information uh, and you can access that via the link, we'll share the presentation, but as well, and it might be something even for you to share on your website, a link to that too. But if you're getting questions from your community, what do we do in this instance? There is a lot of info there that you can access. Um, state highway speed management plans, um, you'll be aware that we're, we're collectively all going through as a result of the new setting of speed limits, the land transport rule in 2022, um, that we have a new speed management planning framework to move through. And then you will also be as aware with the recent changes to government priorities, that that's had a bit of an impact on our process and our timelines collectively. Um, First and foremost, we're continuing to, to work through what exactly the details of the reprioritization by government means. That's more specifically on state highway speed management. Um, and we're working through at the moment the certification of the interim speed management plan. For clarity, that's the one that's really focused on uh, looking at safe and appropriate speeds outside schools, Kura, Marai, and dangerous intersections. Um, we are expecting that to be endorsed within the next couple of months. Um, we'll, we'll continue to, to work and to share alongside you the full speed, state highway speed management plan as that develops. We just need a little bit of um, clarity and we're working through the framework to assess what that top 1% of high risk um, stretches of state highway actually means and how that might impact the, the full state highway speed management plan. Next one, please. When it comes to your speed management planning, um, we have set deadlines and we're required to set deadlines for developing the full, state, the full speed management plans. Um, however, really cognizant, particularly right now for a region like yourselves, that um, you're dealing with a whole lot of other things. 
um, you know, and we've only got, all got collectively so many resources. And while we really appreciate your commitment to developing this and ensuring that you've got safe and appropriate speeds, um, we have communicated directly with your chief executive and your mayor just around a little bit of flexibility in those timelines uh, so it's not quite as close as it once was and if you still have concerns about your ability to meet those particularly because you do want to consult with your communities and what they're looking seeing and experiencing on the roads and um, your teams can work really closely with our speed management teams just to assess the, the most appropriate and pragmatic timeline and way to approach that in Te Tarafati. Um, also related to uh, the changes in government priorities, um, you and your team will be aware that um, there's been quite a focus on vehicle kilometres travelled, uh, VKT reduction uh, of late, and this is more around how do we, you know, most of our vehicles are used for travel of less than five kilometres, uh, mainly just to you know, nip into your groceries or whatever it might be. How do we actually begin to um, have a look at how we reduce how many kilometres are travelled within our light vehicles? Um, that was originally targeting what's called tier one and tier two councils. Um, the government have prioritised uh, tier one councils now. So by the end of 2023, they are required to, to have a full plan in place around vehicle kilometres travelled reduction. Tier one councils are your Auckland, Hamilton, Wellington, Christchurch and... Tauranga. Tauranga. Uh, what are we? Two. Okay. So you now have a little bit more time, essentially. What's identified here is 85% of vehicle kilometres travelled are within those five tier one areas. That's not to say that we don't and won't still support tier twos and other smaller councils embark on this because we do need to get these plans in place for how we um, change how people move around, particularly our urban environments. Um, but the, the pressure has just been released, let's say, a little bit further out to end of 2024 for those plans to begin to be shaped up. So again, just recognising that you've all got a lot on right now and that this is probably not your number one priority in the really short term. Okay, we'll bring it back to um, much more local matters. These are in the Regional Land Transport Plan. Um, we just highlight the, the kind of top three for Te Tairafati that we've been collectively working on for the 21-24. I think we've um, covered the Taruheru uh, walking and cycling, the single stage business case. Um, what I would say is it would be really, really good to make sure that our teams connect once you're happy with your draft um so that we get a little bit of visibility as to the direction that that's going in and we can work with you to make sure that we can look at the best and most appropriate way to progress that to hopefully securing funding um you'll note there the waika gorge um this has been on the cards for a little while through this RLTP and um, the business cases in the final um, reviews, but the funding and construction phase for the project was to be sought for 24-27 NLTP, so that's the actual build part. Um, but this will now be brought into the work we'll cover off later that Sarah is leading around the strategic resilience for the region. So it might be an opportunity to bring that into a, a wider package of works. But Sarah will go into that a little bit more detail if you've undoubtedly got some questions on that. And then the 50 max uh, bridge upgrades. Um, you went great guns on that collectively, uh, your mm -hmm. council, um, and securing some additional funding through the PGF for that means that you've already been able to do, I think, four, just over 40 uh, bridges um, to 50 max capability, which is great. So that's now um, essentially paused. All of those are more than we anticipated have been delivered in this RLTP period. And we'll have a look at what's the plan for the next RLTP. Next one. Um, it was really interesting, the discussion earlier around BAU and response to emergency works and some of the tension that exists for local councils. 
uh, Waka Kotahi is in exactly the same position with that. Um, we're um, as transparent as we possibly can be. This was our uh, renewals, our maintenance program for the summer construction season. And you can see there that it has been impacted by the response work and by um, limitations on the number of dry days in which to, to actually conduct the work, as well as our um, contractors having to undertake um, re response work. Um, so there'll be no further work specifically on the renewal programme in this construction season. Uh, it will continue on the flood response and recovery work though. Um, our peak season here was going really well until February the 14th. We actually thought we might get it nailed ahead of schedule here until that point. <laughs> um, it is, it's a really hard balance to strike on um, continuing with your BAU and the, the response work, especially in a region that does experience the frequency that we do here of severe weather. Next one. Um, so we'll now move on to just looking a little bit further ahead. So considering our um, uh, view to the future, uh, as opposed to you know the 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 here and now or the BAU. Um, so you'll be getting many questions about okay, well, what's the plan for State Highway Thirty Five or for State Highway Two? Um, Sarah and um, will be able to answer undoubtedly the many questions that you've got. Sarah's leading this work right across the East Coast, setting up, um, as well as Hawke's Bay uh, and also Wairoa too. Um, the, the strategic approach that we're looking at here um, identifies options for recovery works in the short term. So what can we do here and now, the medium term, but also the longer term. And importantly within that, the ranges of funding that's required for all of these different options as well. Um, so what, what, we were, what we will be looking at coming out of this is, if you like, an overarching program of work and then beginning to funnel that down for each of those corridors into what those different projects may be. Um, it's been a super effort and thank you very much for the work that your council officers have, have put into this, a 12 week project that's in week 10. Yes. Already. Yes. Um, and it's to support the immediate emergency works that have already taken place. So it's been going along in tandem with that. So what we're looking at is what have we got now and how do we want this network to function into the future in layman's terms? And that is looking through a really strong lens of resilience, first and foremost. So if this, when and if this happens again, how do we make sure that the network stands up to more and more of these events? Um, it will also within this consider what level of performance is required. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what resilience is, and that has to be in the context of the, the region that we're talking about and the level of service that we can and that, we're ex and that your community expects us to provide. And sometimes we all know that there's a bit of a, a gap in there that we have to work through together. The outcomes coming from uh, this strategic resilience plan will then get fed into what we call our collaborative delivery model, which I'll touch on on the, the next slide. Next slide. So our rebuild delivery model, um, because um, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Auckland, Northland have also been impacted. Wakakotai has had to look overall right across the North Island in how we um, actually deliver all of the work that's coming our collective ways. Um, but the, the East Coast, so Te Tarafte Wairoa uh, and Hawke's Bay, it's a huge geographic region with some similarities, but also some differences. But it is quite different from how we're going to approach it in Bay of Plenty and Coromandel and Auckland, Northland. So for this, we've moved towards a, a collaborative model. The word alliance has been used as different connotations, but essentially we brought Wakakotahi Kiwi Rail and then three of the um, large contractors, we call them tier one, but three of the large contractors together to help look at what do we think of the scale of this work and how do we ensure that we're able to resource it over the long term, knowing that we've got the road, we've got the rail, we've got capability, we've got resources required, skill sets, 
And we also have to balance that around the rest of the country that isn't impacted. From there as well, we have to consider who's best place to do this. And how do we do that? And a lot of that is using local intelligence, local expertise and local contractors. So the teams um, that have been putting the uh, delivery model together, they were just up here a couple of weeks ago, again, meeting with local contractors to understand how the market functions here, what the resources are, where do they see their strengths are and um, where they want to and are able to contribute. But as well, what are some of the constraints that they're operating within in terms of size, scale, skills, capability, and how do we partner? Um, the key, the key thing for us here is there's a huge amount of opportunity to build up your local market if we approach this collectively together to provide great job skills, training opportunities for your local communities, and also to build some resilience into the contractors and the businesses, as well as the supply chain here. So kind of got to do a bottom up as well as a, a top down approach to make sure that we get the right model for your region. Um, we have the interim, it says interim alliance, we've got the interim one set up to scope all that out and work through the details, and then we should be aimed to have the, the proper delivery model in place in July-ish. Um, then the work that Sarah and the work that your um, council has fed into then goes into that delivery model and they crack on. Some of that they'll crack on with straight away. Others could be quite a few years away, depending on the size and scale and the amount of funding available. Next slide, please. Um, just a bit of a, a quick update. I know that there will be, it's unavoidable in this situation, some questions around what's happening right now. Um, you'll be aware that we've had quite a bit of work happening on State Highway 2 um, from Gisborne to Apotiki. Um, this is part of the immediate response work. It's a critical lifeline for the region, but because it was one of the few open roads that remained open, the amount of traffic that it was carrying was significant. So we've got a current programme of works to improve and um, stabilise that pavement into the future. It's called Foaming Bitumen Stabilisation. Um, that's going on at the moment. And then we've got another programme of work that we're just about to, we started yesterday actually, engagement on for further um, asphalt resurfacing. Um, it will be disruptive. So that engagement is happening particularly with industry, horticulture, the freight sector, because we, um, we will be looking at um, full road closures overnight for that. So we just need to make sure we get it in step with um, uh, your main businesses that use that route to get their products in and out overnight. Next one, please. And then just uh, lastly, um, I just want to kind of cover off the extent of the damage that we, we saw here. And um, sometimes it's kind of hard to quantify. You get a lot of pictures like this that are circulated in the press. Um, but for example, in your region, we had 45 damage sites on State Highway 2 north of Wairoa, 90 sites, just over 90 sites on State Highway 35, varying in their severity. Uh, in Hawke's Bay, we had 32 sites on State Highway 5 and 98 individual sites between Bayview and Wairoa. It's huge what has happened across the network. And, you know, when we, it's the same for you, the, the bridges and, you know, the huge silt deposits um, are the ones that, that kind of grab the photographs, but there are so many slips, under slips, uh, rivers changing course that have impacted your local road network and our state highway network. The quantum is significant. Um, State Highway 35, um, we've obviously worked really closely with uh, you and the community and on the Mangahuini track bypass, and as well, really supportive of the um, Hikawai uh, community-led bypass. Um, there's some uh, photos to come on what's happening on the, the Hikawai bridge. Uh, on the next slide, please. Um, we're getting tantalizingly close to the Bailey Bridge um, being open. Um, but this week's wet weather, as well as a few unexpected things under the, the river, uh, i.e. we expected, I think, to be able to find hard ground uh, at, at nearly 20 metres, and it wasn't found till well over 30. 
uh, which was quite a bit deeper than expected. Um, so that's just caused some additional technical considerations. Um, the wet weather this uh, week so far is just hampered a bit with the welding that's required on the, the Bailey Bridge, but the piling gates are getting set up. We're ahead of schedule on the um, pavement works at the northern side of the bridge access um, and the launch pad area. So actually getting the bridge over the piles is getting set up as well. So good progress is being made on that one. And it's one of the, or it might be the longest one in the country once it's operating. And the last slide here is just the slide of the remarkably large crane that is used <laughs> because it looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was quite a feat to get it there in a lot of different parts as well, but um, some of those things just signify the progress that is getting made when your community see it. You can't get away from the big pile of um, debris that's at the side in that photo too. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a bit of an update. Happy to take questions on anything I've covered or anything that's in the detailed pack. Thank you, Linda. That's very detailed. Thank you very much. And also the um, the reports that we've got in front of us, the, the detailed updates. Um, do we have any questions from our committee? Councillors? Councillor Thompson. You're just looking at the projects and, and it mentions passing opportunities. Uh, yes. Are those projects, are they put on hold? All these other projects take priority or are they no, no. um the um excellent thing about the work that's been done in the region today is there has been some that have been slowed down or impacted by the weather some of the projects that were underway like koparoa for example actually fared really well um not so well in uh, hail but in um gabriel much better but the passing lane opportunities and the um the resilience work will actually get taken into the work that Sarah's leading, uh, as well as the collaborative delivery model. So it just adds to the full package of work to ensure that we're making 35 and two as resilient and safe as possible. So they won't get stopped or halted or crossed out. They will continue. That's great. Somebody who uses that uh, regularly, it's often, I mean, having more passing opportunities is excellent. Instead of Councillor Thompson. You, you also talked about the um, rebuild delivery model. Um, have we used forestry at all? Just hearing that they've got the big, they've got the big machinery and they can move the um, our maintenance and operations team do work closely and are in regular engagement with the forestry sector and the Eastland Wood Council. Um, and I think um, Sarah and Jack, Jack, our regional manager, maintenance and operations, met with the, the deputy um, chair not so long ago to just discuss some of that opportunity. Um, there are definitely opportunities and we do access them where appropriate, but skills and experience to work on the roads and um, the type of machinery that required is not always directly translatable. Where it is, we, we do try and work together, but it's not a kind of um, straight and immediate switch in every instance. Bye bye, Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Before Gabriel, there was a bit of criticism about the level of maintenance on state highways. Um, has an assessment been done as to whether that lack of maintenance or possible lack of maintenance contributed in any way to some of the damage done during Gabriel? And built resilience. Um, is one thing, but a big part of resilience is good maintenance. So is that part of that new resilience going to be better maintenance? Um, great question. And I'll probably start at the end and work backwards. So certainly, so the collaborative model, but probably even more importantly, the kind of short, medium and long-term plan work that Sarah is leading looks at not just kind of the big infrastructure build, but what does um, the level of service and the maintenance that's required, everything from drainage, planting and trees, right through to the type of pavement that's appropriate to certain environments. 
um, it has to look at that kind of um, the full spectrum, um, not just do we need a bridge here or do we, you know, cut the roadside deeper here. Um, so absolutely agree on that one. Um, and that is definitely part and parcel of it. Um, to your question around have we undertaken a review as to whether it's had an impact? No, I can say we haven't because we've been responding quite honestly. That's where our focus as an organization has been just probably like you guys as well. Um, what I can say though, and I know that local government are undertaking quite a bit of work on this um, at the moment is to have a look at overall, uh, probably over the past 10, 15 years, what have the levels of investment been into roading, into the land transport system and specifically maintenance alongside the state of those assets. So it's not specific to this weather event, it's more to look at how the assets have been managed right across the country. And I think that there will be really valuable insights for us all, um, local roads and state highways as to what has worked and what hasn't, and do we need more investment where on maintenance, drainage, improvements. Um, so I would say that would probably help to answer some of your immediate questions as there's been an impact. It probably won't translate into, would you have fared better if there was more maintenance? I don't think it will answer that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, Councillor Gregory. Thank you. Um, just with regards to um, Kaupuaroa Hill, ever since I've been on council, which isn't that long, but about five years. Um, no, and before that, when I used to report on it, that hill has been an issue. Does there come a point where you say, do you think the road should be there, or do you just plough on and keep on fixing it? Yes. That second option. No, you, we, we would always have to assess what is the best option for a site such as that. Mm. Um, and... Um, with, a, with that kind of issue, the um, infrastructure team, the engineering team would look at different options. So what would be the cost to fix what we've got mm. and what kind of level of service would that provide right through to the other option? If you move it, will it be any better? Mm. <laughs> and that's the kind of challenge and what's the level of investment that's required to go along with that. So in the connecting Tairafati business case, the programme business case of which this was one of the projects that got the funding, um, those kind of assessments were looked at. Um, the issue that we've got in this section is that the ground is highly mobile to uh, you know, quite a depth in a number of different sites. So what, we're, what this project is doing, <coughs> excuse me, is basically to improve overall the state of the existing site. That's the, the best option. What I can say is though, it was actually quite severely damaged as a result of cyclone hail. A lot of work was done in between that and Gabriel, and it was one of the sites that fared extremely well, which was kind of proof in point of, if you get the right solution, the right investment and approach it the right way, you can, you can get better outcomes. The problem with that is that progress has been continually hampered with it. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, you spoke of the Alliance. Yes. What EWI engagement is involved in that alliance? I saw lots of company names and agency, but no EWI. Mm. Um, we have been um, a trying, attempting to engage with EWI right across the, the region um, since the initial response work. Okay. Um, uh, Nawati Apanui, our Puarahi was up last weekend and met with three um, iwi in the, in the rohe um, to ascertain what level of engagement do they want to have in both the strategic plan as well as the alliance model. Uh, what's their um, capacity and how would they like to do that? Mm -hmm. We're waiting to hear from them. And I have been working with Nati Bro, with the chief executive to understand similarity, sim similarly how they wish to engage. Um, the one thing that I would note is that for us, it's an absolute priority 
but for our iwi partners they are balancing many different priorities for their fano at the moment mm -hmm. so kind of respecting that as well as ensuring that we have the right level of engagements a balance at the moment sure thank you for that and um around our region we've got a lot of housing coming yes. into the region and um uh up the coast with whānau that have been waiting for many months uh for the roads to be and, and at the moment sort of crossing fingers that it doesn't rain further but how are the in, in these developments that we've got around our roading um how, has there been any consideration to the ability to move houses up the state highways oh dave um, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, I, I'm neck deep in it for a while at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, what I would say is our teams collectively work really closely together on that. We have a um, commercial vehicles team that specifically work with oversized loads in our regulatory function. They have great relationships with all house moving companies. Um, so, for example, the instance in Wairoa, um, they had a uh, five homes, then 40 that they're needing to ship and all of the roads in were closed that they would ordinarily move them on. How do we get them there with low bridges, et cetera? Um, there are ways and means. I think the kind of key thing is that we get the opportunity to connect our maintenance and operations team, council team, and the house movers, if you like, together to work through everything from state highway, local roads to farm track to forestry track options in those instances. So please don't think just because, say, a state highway might be very narrow that it can't happen. Um, these in, these groups, when they get together, seem to make things happen somehow. And who's cost? <laughs> Who pays for it? In what way? Uh, if there's alternate routes to that where the houses need to go, for example. To you, Chair. So with the works that have been done on the State Highway, all of the bypasses can handle a house going through them. So they're all to legal size, actually mm -hmm. a little bit wider, partly because when we did them with, in particular with Kudu contracting, we made sure they're wide enough to take a cable hauler through, which is more than wide enough to take a house through. So there's no limitations on 35, unless something slips or breaks then we can get through with those. If a house is moving through, it's up to the house mover to make sure that they're legally compliant as they go through. If they're looking to move and go off-road or change access space, that's just for the person moving the house. Okay. So you're, I'm thinking of like D9. Dicky Dicky the hill. You can get through D9. Or the house. Depends which size house. <laughs> Not a tiny house. In pieces you can get through. You should be able to get through D9 now. The house okay. You can get through. All right. The, there is that one section yeah. that is pretty narrow, but that's exactly a case in point for if we work together, how do we make that happen? And it could be as simple as trimming those trees back, or it could be looking at another route. Thank you. Um, can, sure. Councillor Telfast. Yeah, Linda, just going back to um, the EWI consultation there, what, what you said before, I think that was really good to hear um, around talking to EWI about how they how they want to be consulted and if, what they do want to be consulted on and at what level because i think this is something that's coming up around the table here regularly on all sorts of things um it's understanding at what level and you know it's all right saying we're going to consult on anything but um people have got to have the capacity to be able to actually do that and, and i think that's a really important thing is to actually have those conversations first around what do you want to be consulted or at what level and, and, and get that information first? Because it's it's easy to say, um, consult on it, but you know, it, the capacity and the even having the capacity to, to do that side of it has to be appreciated. So mm. that's I think that's good to hear. And I think we probably, you know, that's something I think we as a council need to workshop as well, because um, yeah. Um, thank you, Councillor Telford. If I might respond, we, uh, um, as Council does, but as a, a Crown agency, we have specific obligations under Tatirati uh, in um, how we partner with Mana Whenua, Tangata Whenua. But there it is as well also what's the, the right thing to do. Um, and that's what we're really um, conscious of. We don't want to move at a pace in which we haven't provided um, the right mechanisms or opportunity for all of our partners to be able to 
um, to engage, but really, really cognizant as well, again, that housing, healthcare, education um, are also priorities. So yeah, it's just, it's finding the right balance. I can't say that we maybe we're always gonna, going to get it right, but yeah, that, that's where we've landed at the moment anyway. Thank you, Linda and Councillor Telfair. You raise a good point in that um, having kōrero, or having wānanga, having space for that conversation to be able to happen is really important in, in, in engaging, not just consulting, but engaging um, our iwi and mana whenua throughout the rohe um, in what they are um, willing and able to, to commit to in regards to uh, the relationships going forward, whichever table we're sitting across. So you raise a, uh, a valid point there. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on um, prior, just just prior to Cyclone Gabriel, we um, the count, full council went on a hikoi around the rohe, and we listened to our communities. And um, one of a common theme that we all picked up on was around sort of councillor Aldous picked up on it was around dra drainage and prevention. Um, but also the um, frustration at a community level um, of wanting to help, but not being able to help. So I wonder how, how best um, moving forward, because we know these events are going to happen again. Um, how do we empower communities to be part of the solutions? Um, there are years of experience and expertise out there on the ground in the forestry um, and on our roading crews, uh, but also in amongst our pakeke who have been around for a long time, who have seen the shifts in the land, um, they know the whenua, um, and they, they understand how it moves uh, with, the, with the water, which is a lot of it. Um, how, how might we ensure, like moving forward, that there is meaningful engagement and um, allowing them opportunity to participate in the solution? Mm. Um, I don't know if there's a short answer to that one and I'll probably just use a, a practical example that um, through the setup of the, the collaborative model we, we had senior Waka Kotahi um, staff come in to talk to your local roading contractors and I think what transpired from that was a real realisation of the depth of experience, but also the existing kind of level of thinking that had gone into how um, solutions may be brought forward to, can, especially areas that um, are highly prone mm -hmm. to being impacted, but as well those that have had ongoing issues. And I think that's made us reflect that particularly for State Highway 35, how do we ensure that we bring a lot of that, um, the technical knowledge and the contractor's knowledge into it? Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it's through the work that Sarah's leading while, we're, while we've cracked on with that kind of 12 week big picture view, when we then bring that down, what is the, the best way in which we can engage communities into the different projects that come out of that to bring some of this through, noting that there's there's going to be issues within all within all of that. But if we work through it together, then it, not everybody will be happy, but people will have an understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but as as well within that um, uh, that capacity to enable to engage at the pace that we're required to work to attract funding, we'll just need to to move through all of that. But a bit of assurance that I I would say that Waka Patahi were well aware of it. Yeah. Would that be fair, Sarah? Yeah, it was very, I mean, it was on a real risk when we started this piece of work that because we were, we've got a 9th of June deadline, um, that we wouldn't be doing anything meaningfully, really, in terms of that engagement and consultation. And so, um, in terms of the first amount of work that's going to go into the delivery model, it will be very much that low cost, low risk pieces of work, or for example, why Kerry Gorge on State Highway 2, um, because we've already done a piece of, of work on that, and that has been publicly engaged on, consulted on, and that communities have the ability to also um, 
submit through the um, environment court process that we've just gone through that um, that will allow those kind of engagements to happen but certainly um, with this piece of work um, there will be more um, investigations and more thinking going on and that's recognized then that we will have to get into a into a better space in terms of being um, talking with the communities and things like that so um, immediate things that have a low risk we will just get straight on with but certainly those areas that have medium and high complexities and that includes um, community feelings into those as well so it might be a small dollar but complex we will be engaging um, more meaningfully but understanding as well how um, the communities want us to engage it will be important to us too thank you sarah don't even be your job um <laughs> you know but but you know also acknowledge um you know the the efforts that have been made um and you know, having to deal with a whole lot of emotions as well at the moment, frustration, anger, um, and and appreciate that you that you listen to you're listening to what's being said. Um, the um, and you know, a pat on the back for the winds, we're getting some the winds that are coming through slowly, um, and yeah, just appreciate the work that's being done. Thank you. Thank, thank you for all of that. Thank you. I mean, appreciate that we don't always get everything right, but the the intent to do right is always there. Thank you. I, I'm going to have to be an apology yep. for your next part because I've got a play. I haven't been home all week. So <laughs> <laughs> I like to go home. Your excuse. Then we've got a beautiful day for it today. Yes. Are there any other um, questions for? Um, our Waka Kotahi team, whilst we've got them with us, both of them. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, well, we're going to break oh, early, five minutes early for a cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah. And um, oh, I do that. Thank you, Heather, for um, the reminder. Um, I will close with karakia, though, because I forgot to start with one. My bet, excuse me. Um, we'll close this part of the um, close this meeting, and we will be having a workshop after afternoon. Tea. I'd also like to invite our manuhiri to have a, have a cup of tea with us, and um, yeah, then we'll come back three thirty, three twenty, three fifteen, <laughs> three fifteen for we'll come back to do our workshop. So, oh, sorry. Um, no, uh, we're just we're se just noting and receiving the reports um, for 2021 to 2023 RLTP, um, the quarters one to three monitoring reports, and also the Waka Kotahi regional update for February and May, uh, with much gratitude um, to you for, uh, for those reports. I'm going to go home and read them in depth. There's such a lot of information in there. I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, and yeah. I mean, I also want to thank you, um, Linda, for your regular updates, um, as well as those from Kate around um, the roading network. We've had, I share those on my councillor page and, and the, the responses from the community has been really good, um, very favourable and positive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes um, information is, um, and good information coming from people who are in the know, <laughs> Um, is really critical getting out to our people so that they understand and sometimes the answers are not what they want to hear but it's it's the correct information so thank you um please keep that coming thank you um so i'll just close with a oh sorry yeah, move moving thank you db last report councillor gregory and seconded by councillor telfer all in favor aye aye here's our karakia to close uh oh hang on i just want to acknowledge Mr. Wilson, is this your first and last meeting with us at the regional and <laughs> transport? <laughs> Just want to acknowledge you for, for being here. It'll be your first and only <laughs> meeting with us this year, but um, best wishes in your new endeavours. Um, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, whakataka te hau ki te uru, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. Hia fiana te atakura, he chō, he huka, he hauhu.
Tihei Mori. Safe traveling, Karakia, for you, Sarah, on your way. Kia ora.